This is Talking Mule Deer with your hosts, Steve Belinda and Jody Stemmler. Talking Mule Deer takes you on a journey to learn more about the Mule Deer Foundation, Mule Deer and Blacktail Deer Biology and Management, tips and tactics for hunting, conservation issues, and even features some of our corporate and celebrity partners. Now, let's start talking Mule Deer. We are back at the Western Hunting and Conservation Expo. I'm Jody Stemmler. I'm Steve Belinda. And we are here with a couple of folks who actually get conservation done on the ground. We have with us Stan Baker from the Mule Deer Foundation, Director of Stewardship, and Kevin Zeman from the U.S. Forest Service. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. So, stewardship, what is it? Stan. What is stewardship? Stewardship is an important tool that we're able to use and implement on the ground. It was given to us through the Stewardship Authority, which became permanent in 2014. That was the last farm bill, right? That was the last That's farm the bill. bill. What does it mean? What, it, what is involved? What is stewardship agreements? What is that? What it, are you doing? It gives organizations like us the opportunity to be partners with uh, land management agencies such as the BLM and the U.S. Forest Service primarily to go out and help them increase their capacity to get uh, uh, important reforestation work done on the ground uh, due to budget cuts and a uh, diminishing, if you will, uh, ecosystem conditions that we're seeing on the ground. Uh, it's impossible for any one entity to uh, be able to complete what needs to be done on the ground. So we act as an important partner to those agencies to uh, help them get work done on the ground. And what it does for Mule Deer Foundation, of course, is it helps us uh, benefit uh, mule deer and other wildlife. So we're out there doing habitat work, right? We're thinning trees, we're planting plants, we're doing all sorts of stuff that mule deer benefit. Kevin, you know, from the Forest Service perspective, how do you guys look at the stewardship uh, authority and and how is that different than what you guys normally do most people think of forest service is cutting trees that's a, it's a great question so you know inside of our stewardship authority especially using these partnerships we can increase pace and scale we can cut more trees we can do more timber restoration type work especially with good mule deer habitat in the area with the mule deer foundation here and and mostly increase that pace and scale what we're trying to do is get out there and get more restoration work done uh, there's a lot of areas out there that, that need the help. Well, we can't do it alone. So how do we do that? We bring partners into the to the fold here and we say, all right, let's go to the Mule Deer Foundation. Let's get some, some match dollars, which is really great. We can get dollars that come in from, from different uh, entities when we deal with nonprofit like, like MDF. And <clears throat> then we're able to go out and, and seek these larger projects, get those done, increase that pace and scale, and get more work done on the ground. So it's really exciting and neat when the whole package comes together because we're getting more work done with our partners. And it, again, it's very exciting. Right, so this, this is actually a way to get more done, as you said, Kevin. So it, the, the, the funding that comes along with this stand, this is through a separate funding authority, correct? It's, you know, it's through the master stewardship agreement that was part of the farm bill. It doesn't come through the norm appropriations process. Um, Tell us how you negotiate a stewardship agreement and the different types of stewardship agreements that are out there. You know, every one of the stewardship agreements that we work on is, is a, a different entity, uh, depending on uh, from what region, what area, and we look for opportunities. Uh, as a nonprofit and as a partner to these agreements, we're able to seek other outside funding. Sometimes the state wildlife agencies will have habitat funds that uh, they're able to contribute to us and we can use as match. Uh, Forest Service or BLM dollars, they, uh, they come down as obligated dollars. One really neat thing about stewardship agreements is the ability once the federal uh, funding uh, is obtained or obligated, it's held in check, it's held in place. And so it's secure to where it stays in that agreement. It cannot be, as you know, uh, tapped into for fire borrowing yeah. issues. So, so no one can come rob that piggy bank and it probably isn't affected as much as the uh, when the shutdowns happen because it's already been allocated out there. If you've got work going on on the ground, you don't have to you know, stop everything, which could be disaster for a project. Absolutely. And so uh, th that's another good selling source of uh, these type of agreements is that uh, that money's held in place and it's 
going on the ground for the intended use that it was put out for. And one of the things that's always been uh, really interesting to me is one of those agreements can be using the products that you take to recoup your cost. Explain how that works, Kevin. So with uh, with stewardship, that just that in that name, stewardship, we have our, our own little receipts that come off of the stewardship right. name. So we have stewardship contracts that maybe have been done in the past where those receipts of, of any timber sale value in there, we keep those locally with the Forest Service. We can now use those dollars inside of our stewardship agreements to to add to the funding of, uh, of what's happening on the ground from those the um, timber that was cut. And then also inside of our, our stewardship agreement, our SPA, our supplemental project agreement, we call that, that's actually the nuts and bolts of what we do out there. We'll have maybe timber involved. You don't have to, but you can have timber involved inside those, those SPAs. On that particular money that we have inside of those, we can, again, put that back on the ground right inside that particular SPA. And, and utilize those funds to go do some mastication work or go do some habitat, you know, sp- you know specific habitat restoration work or meadow work. So it's really neat to be able to u- utilize those receipts either from the past or the you know, current and, and put those right back on the ground. And that's, that's what we refer to as goods for services. Right. Uh, and to uh, answer your question a little bit about how, we, uh, how these come about is uh, through collaboration group sometimes uh, they've already identified a key focus area a reforestation area that seems to meet uh, meet uh, everyone's needs as far as reforestation and, and uh, wildlife habitat but uh, uh, it's a it's a mutual interest and a mutual benefit that we really so, work on so MDF's just not running out there and deciding what to do they're working with the Forest Service, with the BLM, with the state fish and game agencies, with the state foresters. What about private landowners? Are they a part of this? They absolutely can be, Steve. That's a great question. So we have uh, we have some rules and regulations within the Forest Service where we have a widen authority that's out there that allows us to cross boundaries inside of inside of our stewardship agreements where we can actually we can add a state's involvement of uh, uh, entity like the Mule Deer Foundation and the Forest Service where you can have multiple different partners. It, it's really endless to think outside the box and side of these stewardship agreements it's really neat how you could do that and you know to expand a little bit on the funding thing it's really cool and, and especially in the state of california there's a lot of money that our u.s government cannot apply for in grants I mean, we're talking about millions of dollars when i first moved in out to uh, uh california i was seeing all this opportunity as a forest service employee and i was going we can't apply for those how do we get those those monies that are associated for land management onto our public lands. There's got to be a way. Stewardship agreements is a very good way to do that. And then the partner holds the money. The partner gets the work on the ground done. And and we're utilizing extra funding that we would never have. We're talking about millions of dollars in some cases. Yeah, that otherwise would just be sitting there not providing for conservation benefits. Absolutely. Now, Stan, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe you have master stewardship agreements in every region in the west with the Forest Service? That's correct. Uh, All six western regions, which include both blacktail deer and also mule deer. And you have one with the BLM in Colorado, correct? Yeah, we, it's uh, similar to our uh, master agreements with the Forest Service. We refer to it with the BLM in Colorado as a statewide stewardship agreement. So you can work within the boundaries of the state then with the Bureau of Land Management on habitat projects underneath the same authority and the same parameters that y'all have been describing. Yeah, last year, in fact, uh, we uh, were able to complete seven projects, uh, seven separate projects, uh, hand thinning crews, mastication work, uh, taking out uh, encroaching pinion juniper. How many acres was that on? About 2,300 acres, and uh, we ended up uh, coming uh, under cost on all that, which gives us the ability to do more acres. You just down supply the road. that at the forward, right? You Absolutely. Just keep doing it until the money runs out, and hopefully, you know, through time and through learning, you know, you get the cost per acre down, it allows you to do more. And you absolutely can leverage that work that you've gotten done for more grants and more work inside that same area, which is great because now you're showing, hey, guess what? We went out there, we did a whole bunch of work, and maybe that grant person comes back and says you know what we got more money this year and we would really like to give you some more because we saw how productive you were with this you know amount of money let's let's give you more this is really cool yeah i know i've experienced that on a project that i'm leading for you in idaho they 
hey, you're doing a good job. It's sort of like we had to prove ourselves before they would fill that kitty up the whole way. Um, now, as you were saying, you know, wildlife, particularly mule deer, doesn't understand property boundaries the way we look at them. And so it's really important that we cross those property boundaries. But we're not just benefiting mule deer here. What other species are we benefiting, Kevin? And, you know, how are these things uh, really looking at the mission of the Forest Service and what you guys are trying to do locally from a, you know, a goal standpoint, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and in, in, uh, in all different states where we're working, this, this habitat restoration is, like you're saying, there's no boundaries. So we got, we got wolves, we got uh, owls, we got deer, we got uh, elk in some places, lots of bears in, in, uh, in California that, that really thrive off of this landscape. And, and, uh, and when we go in there and we do this work, you can, you can go into a cut unit that we've done, say that we did a little bit of a thin in because it was a plantation. You go back in there the next year, it's amazing how you see wildlife thrive inside those units and you go, hey, this is what it's supposed to look like. This is, this is its own little environment of what, it just, it just looks and feels right, you know, when you get into those and, and, and you definitely get that vibe when you drive in of, of seeing a more natural look to, to the environment. In Colorado, um, where, which is where I live, um, I know we've used it for uh, stewardship agreements, and I think in Utah as well, um, as part of the watershed restoration, roughly in, uh, cooperative agreements there, in sagebrush restoration for encroaching junipers, correct? I mean, that's, that's a big thing. So that's tagged in with, with sage grouse conservation, which has been a huge budge word and, and initiative for, for conservation over the last few years, um, broadly across the country. Um, tell me some of the specific projects that you've been involved in that where that has been a goal, where it's benefited sage grouse, because that's what a priority that everybody's talked about, and it's benefiting mule deer. Well, as we all know, uh, when you're doing projects to benefit sage grouse, for the most part, it's benefit mule deer. Absolutely. And uh, we look at projects like that. One, one thing here in Utah, and one reason we were able to start out our program back in uh, 2013. So we're just coming up on five years with the program, and we're seeing tremendous success. But using uh, Division Wildlife Resources and the Watershed Restoration Initiative uh, here in Utah also opens up the ability for us to tap into our conservation permit program, which is huge. So uh, we're able to... Uh, and that's the sale of that's the tags, tags here in the expo. We talked to Miles that about that. That's okay. right. So right. if I'm not mistaken, I think I, I think I wrote a press release on this. It was over a million dollars um, that that not just from the tags here, but as well as some of the the governor's tags and things like that that MDF has sold. That that MDF put towards the watershed re restoration initiative here in the state. We have the past two years, I believe it's been uh, over 1.2 million dollars. It's a lot of and money, and that's, that's leveraging a, that's a lot a, more money. <laughs> and it's a, we're able to tap right back in and put it into these stewardship agreements and other important mule deer habitat projects. Now, one thing with the first five projects we did here in Utah was actually trying to capitalize on summer range improvement working with the Forest Service. Aspen regeneration is a, is a big thing uh, for all kinds of wildlife. Uh, Aspen uh, habitat type is probably the most diverse habitat type there is. And so over the years, we've, we've done a lot of winter range, lower elevation mm -hmm. improvements. Uh, you know, we're finding out, I think, that uh, having good summer range habitat is also equally important in it. It uh, provides uh, some of the animals, uh, the deer, going on to the winter range to, to go on well, to that in better condition. Right, the forage for the fawns uh, oh. and, and, the, and the nursing mothers. So, so it's a real diverse uh, habitat types that we're working in. Uh, again, everything from uh, logging operations, harvest, uh, to mastication, hand thinning crews. But we're trying to open up. We're trying to open up this overcrowding, this over uh, abundance, if you will, of uh, material, and uh, to where we've got more of an early, what we call successional plant species that are coming in that's more beneficial. Well, for somebody who doesn't understand this, we haven't talked about it too much on, on our show yet. Um, the 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 thinning. The the uh, people say, well, I've seen pinion juniper out in sagebrush areas for a long time. They're, they're supposed to be there, right? They are, but they've come in more. There used to be fire regimes that would clear them out on a broader, longer time period. Correct. 
And so they were far more sparsely um, distributed out on the landscape. So you had more of the sagebrush, more of the forbs um, and the grasses underneath. So what's happening as, is as those junipers and pinion pines start to fill in and start to grow, they're taking more water. They're inhibiting the grass growth. Is that, am I? Well, am they're, I they're alleliopathic too, and that's a big word for a lot of us. <laughs> that's a big word for you, yeah. Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Say they, it again. <laughs> alleliopathic, which means they produce an environment that only that plant wants to thrive in. And they do that through their needle drop. Those needles drop, changes the soil morphology, changes the pH, so that nothing else can grow there except that plant. And so what happens is, as pinyon juniper crosses the landscape and invades new habitats, it creates a situation where it becomes the perfect plant for those habitats. And when you get to the point where that happens, it takes a lot to set that back. So your cost for restoration increases. You know, we, we often categorize this as stage one, stage two, and stage three invasion. And when you get to stage three, you basically have a PJ dominated area that you got to go in and take it all out and start from scratch. So, yep. And, and again, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of uh, effort and time in uh, encroaching pinion juniper, but uh, some of this important work we're doing on national forest land is right. the encroachment of the conifers Conif yeah. coming into Aspen. Into Aspen, yeah. right? We, yeah. have, we have Aspen, we have um, just plantations in California. Our big problem was is we, you know, we went out and we did some cutting, we had some burning, we planted these trees, a lot of trees in the early 80s. And we as a Forest Service didn't have the dollars maybe to go out there and do the thinning as time had went by. So now we have these uh, plantations that still look like they're little plantations because they've been, they, there's too many of them in right. one little spot. So they can't grow big, they can't do, they can't release. We call that release. They can't release and go be big. So what are we doing? We're going out there and now we're, we're we're providing that mechanism to go out there and cut those. We have one called the Rattlesnake Project on the Stanislaw. I was out there this year. We used $100, first of all, to go get that work done, which was great. I was out there hunting this year, and we saw two does sitting right in that one unit that we had cut, and they were just happy as could be, and I went, that's the reason why we do this. <laughs> well, and it can be hard because, I mean, for people who don't know, trees are nice trees are good right. trees are in my neighborhood i remember when i was a yep. little kid somebody taught me that little line and and but you know you're kind of led to believe that a, a treed environment is is a good environment so if there are trees there and there but not all treed environments are supposed to be where they are now and let alone the way they are have been managed or fire suppression or not having timber harvest we're not having the same kind of traditional ecological succession um, that is what those other species that are dependent on those habitats have or, or, or need and, and and have available to them so it, it is it, it, it is a long-term decline of the quality of habitat for not just game species but a whole bunch of other species and quite frankly for those tree species and and vegetation species as well well yeah, there, there are folks out there that don't want us to see it cut another tree and you know, that's something that we as biologists and we as conservationists have to do our best is to get out there that you need to actively manage some of these systems. Well, you just can't leave yeah. it all alone. And that's yeah. a good that's a good segue to our collaboration part of the, the uh, stewardship agreements. Collaboration is a huge part of stewardship stewardship agreements. That means we're getting partners together, sub partners. We're getting forests. We're getting BLM. We're getting state agencies. Whenever we're doing this, we're getting a whole group of collaboration going on. So everyone's aware of what's happening out there. So it's really neat when that whole system works and people can ask those questions when we're sitting down and say. You know, why are you cutting these trees? Why are you cutting these PJ? Why are you, you know, making this aspen meadow back to what it used to be? And we can give them the right answer, and they're well-educated when they leave the room, and they go, aha, I get it. That's why you're doing it. We understand. And maybe even walk out and say, I support it, and want to, you know, don't, you know, give some dollars for it. Now, Kevin, i got to ask you this. Um, I think you've been doing this long enough and have been through this before. We just had an administration change last year. We're getting new people in leader pos leadership positions. You have a new chief of the Forest Service. We have new direction coming down. How is that really, how are you at the ground level looking at the opportunities out there to get more stewardship on the ground, including the order, Secretarial Order uh, 3362 that was signed by Secretary Zinke recently? 
So, you know, we <clears throat> I don't deal much with the, the beer, uh, Department of the Interior, but I know on the Forest Service side, um, I'm really proud of my new chief. He is very, very supportive of, of partnerships, and I hope to go shake his hand here <laughs> one of these days. Um, he, he put out a list of, of his top four, five, six things uh, that he's really focusing on right now. Stewardship and partnership is right up there, I think, in three or four that he That's talks awesome. about. And uh, and the support I get for what I do when I go around to the uh, the West here and do these stewardship agreements from internally from our Forest Service is absolutely amazing. Um, education, of course, is the first thing I do, but after that, people get excited, communities get excited, uh, rangers, forest supervisors get excited about this work that's getting done. So it's a tremendous amount of support I'm getting from this new administration. I'm really excited to see how it expands in the next five to ten years. Yeah, it sounds like they're committed to this process. You know, yes. just to, And Stan, that probably leads to you getting phone calls from folks wanting to do this rather than you and after we're going knocking on doors. You know, uh, that's, that's funny because we... Uh, we started out this program wondering how we were going to kick it off and, and make it successful and make it work. And we were going out on the road and, and seeing different forests and, and uh, showing PowerPoint presentations on stewardship and the benefits. All it takes is one or two successful projects and the word gets out. It's word to mouth and now we are. We're getting calls from folks and they're interested in working with us. And again, it's a, it's a tool. It's maybe not for everything, but it's a very useful tool that we've been able to incorporate as our large landscape-based uh, initiative that we have with the Mule Deer Foundation. Well, and the great thing about it is, is you can see the, the results pretty quickly. You know, we're restoring mule deer habitat one acre at a time here. You know, you've got a big project. You've got a wide range of areas where you can do this. You're crossing boundaries. You're working with two federal agencies you're seeing prioritization from the policy makers on these programs it can only look up from here and stan where do you see the mule deer foundation going from here are you guys going to expand out to other parts of the country are you going to start you know doing much bigger projects are we going to be able to deal with some of these dead trees in places you know like the rocky mountain west in california what you know where do you hope we go with this and you know not that we want to put any more work on your plate because you're you know you're busy man <laughs> You know, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. What it's given us, Steve, I think is the ability to really focus and look at those projects across the West that have a tremendous amount of benefit for blacktail and, and mule deer habitat. And, and so uh, working with uh, good partners like we are, uh, I see a tremendous amount of uh, growth in the program and the ability to put good projects on the ground. Yeah, so how can we learn more about this? Um, Kevin, how can we learn more about, you know, how to how to reach out? Just go to the Forest Service website, click on your forest links. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of where exactly we, we post um, stewardship, stewardship agreements. Uh, I guess the best thing to do is go to your local office. If you've got questions, talk to your local Forest Service. Say, do we have any of these happening on our local grounds? If we do, can you educate me a little bit more about what's happening on those? Um, and, or maybe go to the Forest Service website, which is www.fs.fed.us. Yes. And click on your forest and find out who the local contact is. and Give you know, them a call. Yeah, or Stan, I imagine or, that they could go to the muledeer.org website and you know, find your contact information also. I absolutely would be more than glad to pass the good news on to anyone interested. And, and often in the magazine, um, a lot of our regional directors will talk about some of the stewardship projects um, that, that we have initiated. Um, so if you get the magazine, you can look those up. They're also posted in the state web pages. Or just call your regional director um, at muledeer.org. You can find your regional director by clicking on your state. So if you want to find out if there are any of those projects uh, in or your volunteer area or volunteer. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know. So we haven't even dove into the volunteer part, and that, that's a whole other topic of yeah. getting boots on the ground with volunteers. So that's, that's Yeah, the, the more boots, the better is, yeah. is what we always say on that. So, Well, thank you, guys. It's been great. You know, the, the stewardship uh, pro, you know, program work that you lead, Stan, and the Forest Service work that you lead, Kevin, is really exciting. We're getting mule deer habitat work done on one acre at a time, and I can only see great growth from here. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, you for, for joining us. I'm Steve Belinda. I'm Jody Semler. And until we talk to you next time, it's goodbye for now. Thanks for talking Mule Deer with Steve Belinda and Jody Stemler. 
The Mule Deer Foundation is the only conservation group in North America dedicated to restoring, improving, and protecting mule deer and black-tailed deer and their habitat. MDF is a strong voice for hunters in access, wildlife management, and conservation policy issues. To find out more, visit www.muledeer.org and stay tuned for the next episode of Talkin' Mule Deer.